my first question, I have two first questions, which is um, you talk about the present moment differently than I've heard virtually anyone talk about it or perhaps anyone. And then secondly, and related, I can remind you if we forget it. Secondly is um, the, the person who is attending to the emotions and the feelings in the body that is looking outward and that is actually the ego. And what we need to be attending to is our true self, our self. So if you could talk about your view of the present moment, the now, as it were, um, as contrasted with other views that might be out there or just whatever you think it is. And then also the person attending to being mindful is actually the ego. Right. Um, okay, first thing about the present moment. Obviously there's only one present moment, but, or, or at least at each moment there's only one present moment. Um, but how people view the present moment varies. Most, you say other people talk about the present moment differently. What most people take to be the present moment is, is um, a small uh, segment in the passage of time. In that small segment, things are happening. Um, so the, people who say that you should be, a, you should be um, mindful of whatever is happening in the present moment, they are not talking about the precise present moment. They're talking about that small segment in time, um, which is a pro the approximate present moment. But if we go deeper to what actually is the present moment, if we try and analyze each moment, a moment before is past, a moment ahead is future. So between that moment that is future and that moment that is past, there's an infinitesimally um, fine interface. That is, that interface is the precise present moment. That interface is so uh, infinitesimally fine that it is not a duration in time. It is too short to be a duration. So without duration, nothing can happen. In other words, without the passage of time, nothing can happen. The precise present moment is ever standing still. Everything is happening around it, but it itself is standing still. What do we mean? What is it that makes us feel that this moment is present? And what is it that makes us feel that this, uh, where we are, this place is present? In other words, the here and now. The present moment we call now, the present place we call here. What is it that makes uh, the present moment present and the present place present? It is only the presence of ourself, because the, the point in time and space where I exist, that is here and that is now. So. Um, it is it, the, the presence of the present moment and the presence of the present place, in other words, the here and the, the now and the here, are, they, they borrow their presence only from ourself. In fact, in other words, they seem to be present because we are present there. So if we look very keenly at the present moment, not at a, not at a, a slice in the passage of time, but is approximately present, but at the precise present moment, what exists there is only I. Because nothing can happen in that, in the precise present moment, because in order for something to happen, happening is all about change. But the time is the dimension in which change occurs. If there were no change, there would be no sense of time. If we go very deep into the present moment to, to see what is the precise present moment. In the precise present moment, nothing happens. Whatever happens requires a duration of time. Time is, a, time is the dimension in which change occurs. So, but it is only in the flow of... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Being in the present moment, 
that that was a practical demonstration how not to be how not to be in the present moment how to be in the flow of time sounds good <laughs> what what most people call the being in the present moment is just being in the in the flow of time being being uh, approximately present in the flow of time. But if we want to be exactly in the precise present moment, we had to go beyond time because the precise present moment is, is as I say, it is such an infinitesimally uh, fine slice or not even a slice, it is, the, it is, the, it is an interface between the past and the future. So it, there, there is no, it has no duration. So since it has no duration, nothing can happen in it. Nothing can appear or disappear. So what actually exists in the precise present moment is only being, in other words, only I am, only our own being, because the only thing that actually exists is ourself. So being means our own being. I am. Great. And how does that relate to attending to sensations in the body and sort of uh, following your breath and all these things that are otherwise labeled mindfulness these days? My understanding is you see mindfulness as attending to I, not attending to body or objects. Is that correct? Well, mindful. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the problem we're trying to get rid of is mind. <laughs> so <laughs> we are too full of mind already. But, big, but I am just punning on the word. But the term mindfulness generally means attentiveness, being attentive. Yes, we have to be attentive. But to what? Do we want to attend to what is real or to what is unreal? Whatever appears and disappears is not real. Only what is ever shining, ever, in, ever existing and shining is uh, real. The only thing that exists and shines permanently without any change or without any break is I am. The, the subject, the perceiver is ego, which is, uh, is not the pure I am. It's I am mixed with adjuncts. So even ego appears and disappears. It appears in waking and dream, and it disappears in sleep. So that is not real. What is real is the background to ego, or the basis, the ground of ego. That is I am. That is ego stripped of, um, of, um, of adjuncts in its naked glory is just I am. That is what is real. Cool. Um, really quick, I just wanted to bring this up for the audience, how I got in contact very quickly, this is very fast, with um, Metropolitan Kalistos. I wrote him a letter because I had a negative interaction with a local priest, and he was very kind about it. He wrote to me, I certainly do not agree with what the local Greek parish priest said about your guru Ramana. I believe that the Orthodox Church possesses by divine grace the fullness of the truth, but I am convinced that there are many holy people outside the visible limits of, or of the Orthodox Church and indeed outside Christianity. It is not for us to impose limits on the action of the Holy Spirit. So I thought that was very kind and open-minded compared to what I interacted with locally. The, the only other final point I wanted to make on that talk, sorry, is um, you both use the term person differently and anyone who's interested could look that up, but it's of course not essential. And then I already mentioned that you use the word heart differently. For him, it, it, it is also physical for him. So I think I've done justice to his view. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, let's see, what else did I have? Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is you talk about compassion. And compassion is essential and is obvious if you're being egoless. So there are people who follow Advaita and that they become cold and they think this passion requires an uncaring type of attitude, whereas to be egoless, in fact, entails compassion, empathy, and love for everyone because everyone is oneself. Can you talk about that? Uh, dispassion 
in this in a spiritual context means being detached not attaching ourselves to anything to the extent that we are dispassionate to the extent that we detach ourselves from all phenomena we remain as we really are which is as i am i am is the one reality what we are seeing as all this multiplicity is actually nothing other than i am so if we to the extent that we we are uh, to the extent to which ego subsides and remains just as i am there will naturally be compassion that is we will when we see suffering we will what does compassion mean it means suffering with so when you see someone suffering you suffer to see them suffering that is um that that is the the meaning of compassion um the, oh, the, the, that's the basic meaning of the english word compassion but it goes even beyond that because for example bhagavan no one can say bhagavan is not compassionate bhagavan is the very embodiment of compassion when he disturbed a hornet's nest accidentally he was so compassionate to those hornets he but he allowed them to sting his thigh to their heart's content and only when they had were fully satisfied did he move on so that is the that is the the very pinnacle of uh compassion as we can see it in in human existence so uh bhagavan was definitely compassionate does that mean he was suffering with us yes or no bhagavan is actually the fullness of infinite happiness but is ever untouched by suffering so truly speaking bhagavan never suffers but uh, for example if people came to him and told about um calamities in their life bereavement or uh, so on bhagavan would often weep tears hearing uh, listening to what they were saying so it, it seems that he is suffering along with them but actually it's something far far deeper than that because bhagavan doesn't see anything as other than himself he is his love is infinite his love is unconditional he he doesn't love us because of what we are in spite of what we are because he doesn't see us as the person we take ourselves to be he sees us as himself because in his view he alone exists so his love is the absolute fullness of love that manifests outwardly as compassion but we cannot adequately understand his state because how can but the nature of ego is to always see up other so as ego we can never understand adequately the state of the one who sees no other because there is no other so one wouldn't become more cold it would be as bhagavan has said they would be attached in appearance detached in the inner state basically uh, yes yes uh, we can put it in our words but whatever words we put it in is inadequate because we we cannot grasp it in our mind and therefore we the, the words are a tool of the mind what what the mind cannot grasp cannot be expressed in words so um but all we can say he is the ocean of infinite love compassion grace whatever you want to call it um and on that so we can we can know that love only by surrendering ourselves to it in other words only by uh, subsiding back into our source and dissolving as the pure awareness that we actually are because that pure awareness and pure being and pure happiness and pure love are all one and the same thing there's no distinction between them and on that subject you've said part of why you don't think people should drink milk from your perspective yeah um is because i really want people to hear this is because you've said to me privately but then i think you said it publicly too that at the ashram they treated the cows like family yeah yeah i i believe they still do i assume they still do when when bhagavan was there 
when cows, generally in India, many people keep a cow at home. So um, particularly the more, more religious people, they like to have it produce their own milk and also to use it for, for their puja or whatever. Um, but I have seen many families in India, they will keep a cow, maybe one or two cows. When the cow is no longer producing milk, they will then sell it. Why would anyone buy a cow that is no longer uh, producing milk or is not producing enough milk to make it economical to keep? They will do so, they will sell it on to someone else and eventually it goes for slaughter. Um, so, but in ashram, if, if a cow is, is, is there in ashram, it is kept there for life. So even when they're older and no longer produce milk, they are, um, they, they are still kept there as family, as you say. That is the traditional way. That is how it used to be in ancient India. But nowadays, of course, people, circumstances are very difficult. Um, many middle-class families, they may like to have a cow, but they, they can't afford to keep a cow once it's no longer producing meat, milk economically. So it's, and they, like in the West, in India nowadays, in cities, milk is, it's produced, milk is produced and, um, and, um, and uh, marketed on an industrial scale. So um, I, it's particularly so in the West, but I think in, for most people in India, the milk is not produced by ahimsa, ahimsa means. Raman ashram is, is, is an exception. And there will be other ashrams and, uh, and um, places where, uh, where cows are treated similarly, but they are relatively few and far between. So like organic isn't sufficient, for example? No, not necessarily, because uh, oh, the, the, the organic milk production is part of the, is, is, is closely associated with organic um, meat production. So it doesn't, organic does not mean ahimsa. Okay. It, it, it is possible. I mean, it, 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 it's possible anywhere in the world if one has the, the, the financial means and the, the place for the cows to graze, it is possible to produce milk by ahimsa means. But uh, that is very, very rare. On this subject, I know people have been talking about this. I've been listening to your audios. Um, I had a very practical situation, which is my 80 year old, very nice neighbor invited me over for dinner and she gave me a vegetable soup, should be perfectly fine. And then I discover, wait, it was cooked in chicken broth. And then she wants to make me toast. Uh, is it okay to have some sourdough bread? Shouldn't I put butter on it? No, please don't put butter on it. So it's a very practical situation where it's like, I'm trying to be nice to my neighbor who's kindly invited me over, but the soup has chicken broth. She wants to put butter on my bread. I refuse the butter. I mean, what am I supposed to do in a situation like that? Just be like, no, kind neighbor, I cannot eat with you. I'm very sorry. It's against my principles. Yeah. There's no easy answer to these things. You, you have to follow your heart. Fair enough. <laughs> On that subject, I'm sorry to do this to you. You brought up abortion recently. That's the most touchy issue possible. And when I've been pressed on this issue before by other people's opinions, I have noticed, at least it seems from my perspective, that there might be an inconsistency between I want to protect a cow and I don't want to protect a fetus. Would you discuss that? Um, as you say, this is a very touchy subject. It is not a, it is not a, um, it is not an easy subject to, um, that is, Each person has to decide for themselves what they consider right and what they consider wrong. Um, I think imposing our standard of morality on others is another type of himsa. So I, if we are following the principle of ahimsa, we have to observe ahimsa in our life, but trying to impose ahimsa on others I don't think we have a, I mean, it's, again, it's a type of, um, it's a type of, it's, it's another type of himsa. Himsa means harm or, 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 so we, we, we have to do what we consider right, but we 
we shouldn't impose our standard of morality on others. Each person has to decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. Um, and abortion is, there are times when abortion may be necessary for medical reasons. But uh, sometimes uh, mother and child cannot survive together. I mean, one, one or other is going to die. So generally, they, the attitude is to try and save the mother. And in, in early stages of pregnancy, even if you try to save the fetus, it probably won't survive. So there may be certain times when abortion is, is perfectly justified because you, you, it's the, it's, you're saving a life. But there are many circumstances in which it's, it's far less black and white. And um, they, you also have to consider that is, um, women become uh, pregnant under so many circumstances. For example, if a woman has been raped and is pregnant, is, is abortion justified? I don't think uh, there's I'm glad, any, there's I'm glad a, you brought that up because I have a friend of a friend who, who I just read, she wrote that her great grandmother was raped, chose to have the child. So her grandmother was that child and yeah. she went on to have many grandchildren who did really good things in the world and so yeah, yeah, forth yeah, and yeah. she loved her grandmother so yeah, that yeah. was that horrible situation that turned out very positive in that case yeah, yeah yeah i mean that 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 can happen that can happen but um you 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 can't go to if if someone has been raped and is appalled by the idea that they are pregnant and that they're carrying the the child of uh, of a father who has forced, uh, if we go and say, oh, no, 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 I mean, we, who are we to go and impose our, our standard of, of, of morality on others? And they, but you also have to consider the emotional impact of that. I mean, if the thing, but there are many circumstances in life that is the best, um, the best guide to what is a moral, what is moral action is ahimsa. If we, that is, we, as far as possible, we should avoid trying to cause harm. But there are so many circumstances in life where you're faced with the choice. I've, if you choose A, you'll cause one type of harm. If you choose B, you'll cause another type of harm. So uh, it's, we, we cannot totally avoid harm, ahimsa, so long as we rise as ego, um, uh, uh, the very rising of ego is the first himsa, because we are, when we rise as ego, we are we are dividing the indivisible Brahman into all these many parts. Um, we uh, uh, so that is the first act of himsa is our rising as ego. From that, all other harms are uh, uh, ensue. So. In, in this world of multiplicity, what is right and what is wrong is often not black and white. And so uh, that's why I say each one of us has to decide for ourselves what, what feels right for us. And what something may feel right for us, but that doesn't mean we have any right to impose it on others. Bhagavan and says I in the 19th paragraph of Nana, as far as, uh, as possible, one should avoid uh, interfering in the affairs of others. So trying to impose one's own standard of morality on someone else is, is, um, is, is clearly you're interfering in, some, in something that concerns others. He okay, says, so I would like to point out that it sounds like you're supporting moral relativism, but in fact, what appears to be moral relativism is for you rooted on your moral principle of ahimsa. Yes, yes, yes. Interesting. I, in the same, on this line, I, I, there are some countries or, or some segments of society want abortion to be made illegal. I don't, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't support making abortion illegal because ultimately people will, even in societies where abortion is legal, for so many reasons, women go and have illegal abortions, and illegal abortions are often dangerous, both for, uh, for the mother also. So I, we, it's, this is such a, 
it's such a gray area, it, it's not right for anyone to impose on others. Um, if, if you feel it is morally wrong, but I, well, I mean, even to, I, oh, there's nothing we can do. We can't force our morals on others because what you feel is right, another person may feel to be wrong. So who are, you, who, who are we to impose our sense of right and wrong on others? But what I was hearing you say earlier was, in fact, that principle that you have there is rooted on a more basic principle, which is you don't want to be causing harm. So yeah, that's why you don't exactly, want to impose your exactly, morality on another person, exactly, which is kind of still part of your morality. Yeah, it is. It is. I, 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 yes, yes, exactly. Very cool. Um, so I've been paying way more attention to what you've been saying. And first of all, I kind of feel like I need to apologize to you because you understand Ramana's teachings way, 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 way better than I ever thought. Um, so when you say all is one is false, rather it is the only one, that I think I said last time, I think is the most difficult thing to understand that you say, but actually it's kind of like the most plain if you think about it further. So can you talk about, it isn't everything, it isn't all, it is only one. Yes, yes. That is, so long as we see many, we can say all this many is actually just one. But many is many, one is one. <laughs> one can never be many and many can never be one. In, 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 in a certain sense. So how to, how to reconcile this? That is the many is just an appearance. It is not real. But what is it that appears as many? That is real. That is the one. And that's Bhagavan, what I call Bhagavan or Brahman. That is Bhagavan, yes, yes. And we are that. We are that, yes. But it isn't you and me, it's just that. Yes, yes. We singular are that. We singular, beautiful, not bodies. Not bodies, no. The I, uh, that which is shining in each one of us as I am, that is, uh, that is what is real. That is the one. What, what distinguishes your, what seems to distinguish your I am from my I am? It's only the, it's only the, the adjuncts. If you strip away the adjuncts, Remove Sean and remove Michael, and what remains is only one I am. Do you object to people taking you as guru? Uh, well, I think that if anyone who takes me as guru is misguided. Firstly, they don't understand what is guru, and also they don't understand me. I am just a very ordinary person. Um, uh, I, moreover, the function of the outward guru, that, that, that is Bhagavan is guru. What he, he exemplified, what is the function of the outward guru? The function of the outward guru is to turn us within. So even Bhagavan didn't accept the role of guru. Though obviously he was guru, he never said, I am guru. He never, when people said he, 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 he always, um, he always, um, well, he, he, he never uh, directly accepted the role of guru. I mean, it's, it should be obvious to anyone that he is guru, but guru doesn't say, I am guru. Guru says, guru is that which is in you as I am. Do you kind of feel that it's obvious, at least for some people, that you're a guru, even though you would never say you're a guru? Or is it it's yeah, just Bhagavan, that, period? Well, for me, for me, Bhagavan is the guru. I, I'm not saying that guru, there is only one guru. Guru may appear in different forms, in different ages, at different times, different circumstances. Guru may appear in different forms. But for me, if at all guru is to have an outward name and form, it is only Bhagavan or Bhagavan or, and Arunachala, who I consider as one and the same. So um, that is for me personally, and that doesn't mean others who may take um, who may take s s uh, some other name and form as guru. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I'm just saying for me, Bhagavan is guru. And the, we need to understand, as I say, we need to understand what is the function of guru. The sole function of guru 
is to turn our attention within. As, as Bhagavan said, God, Guru and Self are one and the same thing. People worship God as another. So because God is actually that which is shining in everyone as I, God has to appear outwardly in the name and form of Guru to say the God you are seeking outside is actually that which is always shining in your heart as I. Only when you know what you yourself are can you know who God is or who Guru is. So the whole function of Guru is turning our attention within. So anyone who, who for, for example, if someone takes me as Guru, it's meaningless because I'm not bringing, I, I, I have nothing to contribute. But uh, I mean, it's all being said by Bhagavan. All I'm, all I'm doing, I'm repeating what Bhagavan said and I'm, I'm trying to, because what Bhagavan said, though Bhagavan's teachings are very, very simple, they're also very deep and very subtle. And uh, because people, because generally the human, our mind is complicated, it's very difficult for us to grasp the simple essence of Bhagavan's teachings. So all I'm doing, I'm just pointing out the simple essence of Bhagavan's teachings. I'm, 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 this isn't the role of a guru. I'm just, I'm just, um, I'm just, uh, sharing my, my, uh, uh, my understanding of Bhagavan's teachings with others, that's all. And I do so, why? Because people ask me questions and because I myself love to talk about Bhagavan's teachings because I love his teachings. I don't love his teachings sufficiently. If I loved his su teachings sufficiently, I would turn within and merge back into the source. So I'm still on the path. My love is still imperfect. So that's why taking me to be a guru is meaningless because how can someone who, who hasn't yet saved himself save others? It, it's, it's meaningless. Very interesting. So that's sort of your objection to other gurus is it's kind of like an eye rising saying, I can save you and pay me some money too while you're at yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean... Um, <sighs> There are all sorts of gurus. Some are total, I mean, all sorts of people who have the label guru. Some are total frauds. They're in it only for money. Some may be very sincere. They may think themselves, I mean, there are many people who genuinely believe that they are enlightened because they don't understand what um, that is. The, the term enlightenment or realization or whatever, it, what is under that people understood stand the same term in different sense. The sense in which Bhagavan uses the, the, the I mean Bhagavan didn't actually talk about enlightenment or, or realization. These are actually uh, but he said all words that approximate to that, that is Atman Sakshakara, Atmanyana, whatever you choose to call it, that is all liberation. It's all nothing but annihilation of ego. When ego is annihilated, who is there remaining to say, I am liberated, I am self-realized, I am enlightened? You have said multiple times that you're not enlightened, which, as you know, Bhagavan says is a grounds for ridicule, just as it much is. as saying, it is. I am enlightened. But you've said to your point that it's better to be wrong and ridiculed for being humble rather than being proud. Yeah, I, I don't even say I'm, I'm humble, but I would prefer to be... Uh, if I, if I say I am realized, I'm being dishonest because I know there's still ego here with the Bishay of Asanas and everything, so it would be a plain lie. It is ridiculous to rise as ego itself is ridiculous. You don't even have to say I am, I, I am, um, I, I don't know myself. How mere rising, to say I am Michael, that is equivalent to saying I don't know myself because Michael is not what I actually am. So, so long as I'm aware of myself as I am Michael, <laughs> I don't know myself. But even when I know myself as I am Michael, what I actually am, the pure I am, is always aware of itself as it actually is. So, um, as Bhagavan said, there's, there's nothing for us to gain. That is, we already know ourselves. He, he says in verse 26 of Upadesh Undia, uh, um, being oneself alone is knowing oneself. 
we all are being ourselves, so we all know ourselves. But trouble is, we don't, we don't, we are not just being ourselves, we are adding something to that. Instead of just being aware of ourselves as I am, we're aware of ourselves as I am Sean or I am Michael. That is where the problem arises. So, because it, it, the, the ignorance is just a wrong knowledge superimposed upon the the real knowledge. The real knowledge is just the fundamental awareness I am. Ignorance is superimposed on that. There is not any, no one ever says I am not, or no one is, is ever ceases to be aware of themselves. We are always aware of I am. So the, the jnana is always shining there. But it is seemingly obscured because we mistake ourselves to be this or that. And so you've made the point multiple times, but I've only finally heard it more clearly that Michael and Sean can never be enlightened. That's the fraud. No. Only I am is what is enlightenment. And that's yes. what we yes. all are in our deepest yes. nature. Yes. How can anything other than pure awareness know pure awareness? And how Very can pure awareness ever not know pure awareness? So it, it's just a matter of removing the unreal and what remains is the real. Where Bhagavan used to joke about the English word realization. He said, how can you realize what is already realized, what is already real? The problem is we have now realized the unreal. So all we need to do is to unrealize the unreal and the real alone will remain. One thing I find interesting is that Bhagavan only said publicly, as far as I know, two beings were enlightened, Lakshmi and his mother, both at their passing. Can you talk about that? Um, about Lakshmi, Bhagavan wrote a verse in which he used the term Vimukti. And Devaraj Mudliya asked Bhagavan, is that just a formality or did she actually attain? Bhagavan I don't know exactly what he replied, but he indicated, yes, she actually attained. Um, he also indicated the same about his mother. Um, there may be others also. I, I mean, Bhagavan didn't proclaim some of his like It was just um, in certain circumstances, Bhagavan did indicate. I mean, what is enlightenment? It means that the ego that was in that body, taking that body to be I, has been eradicated. Never to rise again. Yeah, yeah, that is. Bhagavan said, Lakshmi attained uh, uh, her vimukti nal. The day she attained liberation was such and such a day. He wrote a verse as a on for, which was carved on her tombstone. That was a, a verse just saying the time and date in which she attained vimukti. Um, what is mukti according to Bhagavan? Not as he says in verse forty of Ulladunapdu, but. but only the annihilation of ego is mukti. So it is not, it is not saying that Lakshmi attained mukti. <laughs> that is that ego that took itself to be I am Lakshmi, that ego was swallowed. And that is formality we say Lakshmi attained mukti. Now what's so, interesting about that to me is one of the reasons is they both attained not because of their knowledge, but because of their devotion. Is that correct? So to speak, they no, attain, so wrong, to speak. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay. Nobody attains except without devotion. But okay. the, the attainment is itself knowledge. But they don't, so, what I'm trying to say is they don't have intellectual knowledge. Obviously, being devoted yeah, to Bhagavan, but intellectual Bhagavan is knowledge. knowledge. So long as you know I am, that's all you need to know. You don't need intellectual so, the intellect so even small texts like Uladu Narpadu and Upadesha Yundiyar and Nanar, we don't really have to know even those. Is that correct? If so long as we know I am, that's the whole teaching. That's the whole teaching. That's what, that's what the, who am I and, um, and uh, Uladu Narpadu are all about, is just knowing I. They are all pointers. But we, as Bhagavan said, you cannot get from, merely from texts. You cannot get self-knowledge. What we are seeking to know is inside ourselves. So those texts are very important in pointing us back towards ourselves. But it's only when we follow what they, uh, what is recommended in those texts, which is turning and sinking within, then only we will be uh, we will be swallowed. Cool. Um, I have a, 
a number of things written down. I'm just going to sort of go at it, I guess, if I see something here. Oh, I did want to say regarding free will and destiny, that, su that subject comes up an awful lot. And I just wanted to say in a really simple way, if you take out the karma law for, for, a, se for a second and you say, I, it seems to me very simple and commonsensical what you're say saying, if you really think about it, you're just saying you can try really hard to accomplish something, but you might not accomplish it. If you don't accomplish it, it wasn't your destiny to accomplish. If you do accomplish it, it was your destiny to accomplish, but you can try and try and try. You're free to try and try and try. And if you don't accomplish it, it's not your destiny. If you do, it's your destiny. Very simple. Yes, but a, a little more than that. What is your destiny is going to happen anyway. So you don't have to worry about trying for anything. If it, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Whatever is not going to happen is not going to happen. So our being concerned about what happens is futile. It's going to happen or it's not going to happen. It's all going on. The only thing we should be concerned about is to whom is all this happening? We should be turning our attention back towards ourselves. So long as we have an interest in what is happening, that is so even go deeper. So long as we rise as ego, we are concerned about the we are concerned about this body. And therefore, since the things happening in the world affect this body, we are concerned about things that happen in the world. So we are constantly, whenever we rise as ego, we are constantly being driven by our desires and our hopes and our fears and our so on to do this and to do that. It's inevitable when we rise as ego, our will, will, will our, our will, that's our likes, dislikes, desires, and so on, will be functioning and will be driving us to do action. We can reduce the, by reducing the strength of our desires, of our, of our outward going will, our vishaya vasanas, we reduce the extent to which we are swayed by them to do action. But we will continue doing action swayed by them so long as we rise as ego. To, to a greater or lesser extent, we'll be, we'll be doing action swayed by them. So it seems to me that in another way, what you're saying is really just be at peace about the whole thing. Yes, but how to be at peace about the whole thing? I and mean, it doesn't stop there. It's very easy to say be at peace. <laughs> But we, we are not at peace. So long as we rise as ego, we are not at peace. So, so the way to be at peace is to be I am, something like that. Exactly, exactly. We, it's only by turning within and thereby bringing about the subsidence of ego that we can truly be at peace. Any other peace is only a relative peace. So the irony there is that trying to bring people peace and turn within has brought all sorts of discussion at length about this particular point, whereas what you're trying to say is simply abide as I am and don't worry about it in a sense. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. But why does it lead to so much discussion? It is because people are so interested in things other than themselves. Both fate, both will and fate are other than ourselves. Even this ego who has a will and is affected by fate is other than ourselves. What we actually are is only I am. So we, everything else, everything other than I am is unreal. So the whole of Bhagavan's teachings is telling us cling only to I am. What he taught us about the law of karma, about, uh, about will and fate, is only to help us, to, to, or to, to, uh, to help us give up the motivation to go outside. In other words, to encourage us to turn within. That's the whole Can purpose of it. People, people are ignoring the central point of Bhagavan's teachings. And so they get into arguments, whether it's fate or will, or which is, whether is this action fate or is it will? How do I distinguish the two? All this is, all this is an atma vichara. We are investigating things other than ourselves. What is atma? Atma is that which is shining in us as I. That is what we need to cling to. That is what the whole of Vedanta is all about. You are that. Cling to yourself. That is the implication. And then how are we supposed to do that? <laughs> um, 
so long as we ask how, we are still not really listening to the instruction. That is, you are that. Not, not you, Sean, are that. You. That which is shining in you as I am, that is Brahman. That is what you need to cling to. Now we are clinging to things other than ourselves. So long as we allow our attention to go away from ourselves towards other things, we are clinging to those things. That's what Bhagavan describes in verse 25 of Uludhanapadu when he says uh, talk about ego, grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on forms, it, uh, it uh, grows abundantly or it flourishes. Um, leaving form, it grasps form. It's sought, it takes flight. That is, so long as our attention is going away from ourselves towards forms, that towards anything other than ourselves, form there doesn't mean just, uh, just physical forms. Any phenomenon is, is a form of one kind or another. So thoughts, feelings, emotions, all are forms. So forms are other than ourselves because what ego essentially is, is just a formless phantom. That is, it has got no, uh, it's formless because it's got no form of its own. It's a phantom because it's got no substance of its own. It borrows its existence and its awareness from such it. And it borrows the form from the body. It's not either of them, but it, it, it uh, misappropriates both. And only when we rise as ego, thus rise as ego, and the nature of ego is to cling to forms because it's only, if it doesn't cling to forms, it cannot rise or stand. Um, so the ego is constantly clinging to form. This ego whose nature is to cling to form, we need to try to make it cling to itself. That's what he means by if sought. So if we try to, to, to hold on to what, who am I? And when we, as Bhagavan says, when we are investigating this ego, what we are investigating is, is ego is the mixed awareness. I am this person, I am Sean, I am Michael. Our aim is not to investigate Sean or Michael because that is an atma, that is other than ourself. Our aim is only to investigate the I am portion of ego. That's why he often expressed it in another way. He said, investigate the place where ego rises. Where is the what is, place there he's using metaphorically? What is the place from which ego rises? Only from I am. So it's I am we should cling to. That was one of the uh, questions I had. Means is if attend there's... to. We should be. Sorry. We, uh, I am means yeah, clinging to I am means just uh, being self attentive, attending only to our fundamental awareness I am. That was one of my questions is in, in another, in a lecture I heard you say, similar to what you just said there, if not exact, you said, What is the source from which I've risen? And that's another way of asking who am I, of investigating who am I. Yeah. What is this, you know, and so I was just curious if there's any other ways of presenting the investigation question or instruction um, that might sort of work for some people rather than who am I like, like this one I thought was pretty cool. What is the source from which I've risen? Yeah, well, uh, Bhagavan was pointing only at one thing. He was trying to direct our attention back towards ourself. That's what self-investigation is, directing our attention towards ourself, facing, trying to face ourself alone. He's expressed it in so many ways. I mean, if you, the variety of words he's used, Atma Vichara is a well-known word. What does Atma Vichara mean? Self-investigation. What is the self we have to investigate? It's only that I am. How do we investigate it? Only by observing it or attending to it. Uh, he's also called it Ahamukam. Ahamukam means, uh, has uh, two meanings because um, in Sanskrit, Aham is the first person singular pronoun, I. Um, so it has that meaning also in Tamil, but it's also a native Tamil word, but means inside. And thereby, by extension, it means heart, home, it can mean mind, it can mean, um, it can mean even a, a, a house in which you live, that you can call it aham. That, uh, aham means simply what's inside or an abode. Uh, so, but the real aham is only the heart, only ourselves. 
So it, when Bhagavan talk, uses this term ahamukam, we can take it, we can interpret it in two ways. Either it means facing within or it means facing eye. But those two meanings mean exactly the same because what is within is only eye. So that's another nice term, ah, ahamukam. He used, also used ahanoku. Ahanoku means looking within or watching within. Looking within, we can say. He's used um, various Sanskrit terms. Uh, Atmanu Santana also means self-investigation. Atman Vaishana. So there are so many terms he's used. Uh, in Tamil, he used a very simple equivalent of Atma Vichara, Tannatam. Tannatam means, again, self-investigation. He also used it, sometimes used it as investigating who am I or investigating uh, what am I or investigating what is the place from which I rise? There's so many ways he's explained it, but, but all these different ways of expressing it are all pointing at one thing. They're pointing back at I. I is the uh, crucial thing. When you say turn around, you, you often say like turn and look within and you talk about 180 degrees. In a way, can you say in another way of saying that, can you say like it's kind of just looking at the center, being as you are. Yeah, yeah. Remaining in the center, being the center. Very cool. That doesn't mean the center looking outwards. Being, just being the center and <laughs> attending only to the center, being attentive to the center. What is ever center, what is ever central to all our experience is I am. So you do see and phenomena. Center means what? Bowen often talks about heart. That's all he means by heart. He said, heart is that which is shining in you as I am. That is the center. So you do see phenomena, but it's just kind of like not, it's still, it's not multiplicity, but there's just, there's just I. But you still kind of see things, right? Or not? Um, when we are turning within, um, whatever words we use, these are pointers, so we, we can't take it too literally, but we, we, to, to express it in simple terms, we, now our attention is facing outwards towards phenomena. We are trying to turn back to face ourselves. In other words, we're trying to turn 180 degrees. Uh, that means 180 degrees means towards ourselves and away from all other things. In practice, when we are, when we are practicing self-investigation, we are not turning the full 180 degrees. We are turning somewhere between uh, naught and 180 degrees. To the extent we come close to uh, uh, turning 180 degrees, to that extent, other thing, phenomena will withdraw into the background of our awareness. But even when we've turned 179 degrees, there's still a lingering awareness of phenomena. Only when we turn 180 degrees have we totally turned our back, so to speak, on all phenomena. In, in practice, how this is experienced, to the extent we are, we are keenly self-attentive, to that extent do all other things recede into the background of our awareness. Phenomena still remain, until we turn 180 degrees, but they they are they are in the background of the, our awareness. Just like if, if you're if you're reading a book and it's a very interesting book, you you hardly notice anything that's happening around you. You may be traveling on a train, there may be all sorts of things may be happening around you, but because the book is so interesting, your whole attention is on that book and you're not noticing anything that's happening around you. So though on the periphery of your awareness, there are other passengers and the train is moving, whatever, uh, all those things are there, but you're hardly aware of them because your, your interest is so much in the book. It's just like that. Our interest, to the extent we are, our interest is on attending only to ourselves. To that extent, other things recede into the background. Sometimes you, it's hard to get a word in sometimes with you, so I'm not sure okay. when to jump okay. in. Actually, I wanted, to, I wanted to mention that I've been listening to your lectures and I've come to see it differently. Like sometimes people feel like they have to say, no, I really want to make my point here. And But I feel like now that I'm listening to your lectures, it's kind of like you're speaking from I and you're kind of interrupting egos, like so you can continue the presence. And that's my new perspective on that, but. 
maybe. <laughs> maybe, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Um, okay, sorry. Anyway, um, my question was, uh, you've talked about 180 degrees, 179 degrees, but in another place I heard you say that you can't, it, there is no in-between. You're either oneself or your ego. So long as, until we turn 180 degrees, we are ego. That is, so long as we have the slightest awareness of any phenomena, we are still ego. Because the nature of ego is first to be aware of itself as I am this body. And consequently to be aware of other things. That is, as soon as we take ourselves to be a form, we are consequently aware of other forms. The form we take to be ourselves is the form of this body. This body doesn't mean just the physical form. It means all the five sheaths, as Bhagavan says in verse, um, verse five of Uludhanapadu. He says, Udul pancha koza uru. The body is a form of five sheaths. All, therefore, all the five are included in the term body. So when Bhagavan talks about body, the form of the body, he's meaning all these five. So these are different levels. The grossest um, sheath is this physical body. Slightly subtler than that is the life that animates it. Slightly subtler than that is the mind, the grosser functions of the mind, that is. Subtler than the mind is intellect. Subtler than the intellect is will. But all of these are relatively gross compared to that I, which is aware of itself as all of these things. So when we rise as ego, we, 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 we create this bundle of five sheaths and experience it as, as ourself. And we are consequently aware of other forms, both the physical forms of the world and all the subtle mental forms, our thoughts, feelings, emotions, and so on. So these are all forms. As Bhagavan says in, in, in verse four of Uludhanapadu, if oneself is a, a form, the world and God will be likewise. If oneself is not a form, who can see their forms and how? So ego is that which experiences itself as a form and is consequently aware of other forms. So as long as we're aware of forms, that means phenomena of any kind whatsoever, we are still ego. When we turn the full 180 degrees, we are aware of ourself alone. In the state in which we are aware of ourself alone, we are no longer ego. We are pure awareness, which is what we actually always actually are. So I have, um, I mean, I kind of have a lot on this list. Uh, oh, here's one. This is a good one. I like it anyway. Okay. Um, regarding karma, you said, God is not punishing us. If we suffer, it is to purify and mature us. Can you talk about that? Yes, yes. Uh, that is, um, God is love. So God will not, um, God, whatever God is doing, he's doing for our good. God isn't actually doing anything. All these things happen in his mere presence, as Bhagavan says, but it's all happening for our good. So the fruits of our past karmas, we in, we in each lifetime, so long as we've got strong will, we are producing far more fruit than we are experiencing. So the sanchitta is a, is, is a huge pile of the fruits of past karmas. From that huge pile, God selects a very small proportion for us to experience in each lifetime. So sometimes we may, there may be unpleasant experiences. We may suffer sometimes. Sometimes we may have pleasant experiences. Why does God select sometimes pleasant experiences, sometimes unpleasant experiences? He, it is not a system of reward and punishment. It, it is, he, is, he is using those fruit, but he, he selects those fruit which will be most beneficial for us in terms of our spiritual development. That is God's sole aim. God isn't out to punish us. In another even, way, even if, kind we, of... even if we go to hell, I mean, because uh, it's, so long as we rise as ego, we, we can ex we experience the body as I, and the world in which we experience ourselves can be a world like this one, or it can be a heavenly world, or it can be a hellish world. So there, um, 
states of heaven and hell do exist, but they're all only in the mind, of course. But even if we have a life in hell, it's also hell is unlike the, the, um, the Abrahamic religions, which consider heaven and hell to be eternal states. It is not eternal. That is, uh, whatever state we experience, it's the fruit of our karma. But karma is a finite, and the, 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 what we re experience as a result of them is also finite. So sometimes we may be put in hell. We may have a, a life in a hell-like condition. We don't, it doesn't even have to be in another world. Even in this world, plenty of people's lives are hell. Um, I mean, people, some people who are, for example, if people are born into slavery, for example, they, they live a pretty miserable existence and um, are overworked and ill-treated and beaten and all sorts of things. So um, <laughs> heaven and hell don't even, I mean, of course, it's all in the mind. Whatever state we experience is in the mind, but uh, there, there are relatively hell-like states, even in this world, and relatively heaven-like states, even in this world. So some people have all the comforts and conveniences, and uh, everything seems to be favorable for them. Of, of course, all these things are relative. Well, what I'm saying is, even if we are in a hell-like state, or a hell-like world, we are put in that state for some good, for our own spiritual development. So whatever happens is happening according to the will of God for our own benefit, our own spiritual uh, uh, development. How, how does being in hell help me? We can't say. He, God alone knows what, what, is, what type of experiences will uh, be most conducive to our spiritual development. What is meant by spiritual development? So long as we, we have strong desires, attachments, uh, likes, dislikes, and so on, we are relatively undeveloped spiritually. The more we uh, detach ourselves from all these desires, likes, dislikes, and so on, the more uh, developed we are, the more mature we are. I would like to say, too, that there are more sophisticated understandings, even in traditional Christianity, St. Isaac the Syrian believed that all would be saved. There's a line in the Bible yeah, yeah, that yeah, says, uh, yeah, all may be saved. There's a, I, I, there's a I current. Would, I was just saying to the, the, the general idea, but I think generally in Christianity, if you're, yeah. if you're saved, it's, it's, it's eternal salvation, but you retain your individuality. Right. Whereas according to Bhagavan, Whatever state in which you attain your, retain your individuality will be a temporary state. The permanent salvation is only when that individuality, your ego, is eradicated. And St. Paul did say, they don't seem to interpret it this how we interpret it, but St. Paul did say that there isn't, as you, as you know, there isn't life left in him, but just Christ Jesus. That's all that's left. It's not him yeah. any longer. It's just Christ Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we already did this one. It seems to me that everything you say can be, can be reduced to I am, and that those two words can be reduced to silence, which is presence or sanity, such as an yes. but, but the words I am, what do they refer to? They refer to that silence which is ever shiny in our heart. As our own self. Very cool. Silence is our real nature. And Bhagavan was very silent outwardly. He didn't speak very often. Is that right? Uh, yes and no. Um, um, yeah, a lot of the time Bhagavan was sitting silently. People would come and ask questions. Sometimes he'd reply. Sometimes he'd just remain silent. But at the same time, he's not, he's not aloof. Children who were there... Um, there's a beautiful video from the centenary. If you go to the Arunach Ashram uh, website, um, I mean, to their YouTube channel, they have a, they have a playlist on all the videos. Uh, I think there's, they, I don't know whether they've added all, everything to it, but they, they, they have been gradually adding more to it. There was one video they added a few weeks ago was um, a video of, of, um, of uh, 
Katya Osborne, um, that is uh, Katya Douglas, who was in those days Kitty Osborne. And she talks about her childhood in Bhagavan's presence. So she said, whenever they saw something interesting, they said, oh, we must go and tell Bhagavan about this. So if they go and tell Bhagavan about it, it may be the most uh, trivial matter, Bhagavan will take interest. So whether it's old people, young people, Bhagavan takes interest in whatever people say to him. That's but cool. at other times, someone may come and ask some very lofty philosophical question. He just keeps quiet. <laughs> <laughs> he takes so much in. When, when, um, when Bhagavan lived on the hill, there were children in the town who, would, who wanted to, who would, at, on, at the time of Deep Orly, they would bring their fireworks to, to play their fireworks with Bhagavan. So he would play fireworks with them. So Bhagavan is the simplest of the simple. I always think of, for some reason, when I can't, uh, K Kapali, I can't remember his name, KK Namni, I can't remember. When yeah. he was there with his camera, Bhagavan yeah. said to film the white peacock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this was a question I had. This was a little bit unusual for me. Um, I think it was in Guru Vachikakovai. Uh, Bhagavan says, you should always have non-duality, basically, but you should never have non-duality towards the guru. Would you please talk about that? Yeah, that is verse uh, 39, I think, of Uludhanapluana Bandham. That is a verse Bhagavan translator. I think it was from a work of Shankara called Tatvu Padesha. What is said in that verse is, always have non-duality at heart, but never put it into action. You obviously can't put it into action. If you try to put non-duality into a action, it only occurs in the state of duality. So it's meaningless to try to put it into action. And then he says, wait a minute, I'll see if I can I'll get the verse. Because then I can say it more accurately. Advaitam. Endrum ahatu uh, urha, always have a dvaita in the heart. Or uh, orupodam, even once, a dvaitam segeil uh, ahatu, do not try to act a dvaita or put a dvaita into action. Um, uh, Putrine means, O oh son. Uh, a dvaita, a dvaitam, uh, mu ulhatu, um, uh, angum, that it, it's appropriate, e, 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 even in the three worlds, Advaita is appropriate. Guru Vinodu, with the Guru, Advaita uh, uh, is not appropriate. Uh, know this. What he means by it's appropriate in the three worlds, the three worlds there refers to uh, Brahma Loka, Vaikuntha, uh, which is Vishnu Loka, and Shiva Loka. It means you could. You, if you want, you can even go to, to Brahma Loka or Vishnu, to Vishnu's world or to Shiva's world, and you can say, you and I are one. But you should never do that to Guru. <laughs> what that means is, Guru is, a, that is, even these gods, are, are, that Guru is the highest of all. Because those gods, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, all have their own functions. Brahma's job is creating the world. Vishnu's job is sustaining the world. Shiva's job is uh, bringing about the dissolution of the world. So, so they, 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 uh, they, they have some function, whereas the Guru's function is to remove the Ajnana in which the appearance of this world comes into existence. So Guru is the highest of all. So you should never um, put a weight... I mean, obviously, he's not recommending that you go to Shiva Loka and say to Shiva, you and I are one. Though it is recommended you meditate Shiva Ham, Shiva Ham, but never Guru Ham, Guru, Guru Boham, that you shouldn't say, say, I am a Guru. You can say, I am Shiva, but not, I am Guru. But it's not recommended that you, you should go to Shiva and say, you and I are one. It is just a way of emphasizing that we sh you, you should always be humble before Guru. That makes sense. The guru is the highest of all. So anyone who says, I am Guru, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I, I like that about 
the tradition that's come after Ramana, just just he's the guru or Arunachala's guru. I think that's yeah. cool because, like you say, Marugunar could have could have taken that position. He said he actually said, "Go talk to Bhagavan Samadhi." Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. Um, I have. Let's see. Because Bhagavan has taught us, but Guru is always shining in our heart as I. The whole point of the outward Guru is to turn us within to merge in that eye. When we merge in that eye, we are truly one with Guru. But we shouldn't rise and say, I and Guru are one. So as soon as we rise, we have set, the separation is there. So a problem that I have, even when we're talking sometimes, is I'm thinking about helping other people. And last time you actually corrected me and you said, if it's sufficient for you to get what I'm saying here in this point. And I thought that was a, a great point. So I really have trouble with that. I'm constantly like, how can I help other people constantly? Because, yeah, because it, it, it is natural. Right? So long as our mind is going outwards, we are concerned about the world. We see we see people and we, that, that is, we have, we, at least have an inkling of the value of what Bhagavan has taught us. So we want to, in our enthusiasm, we want to share it with others. But Bhagavan didn't teach us this to share it with others. He taught us it to, so that we turn within and um, merge within. When we, uh, when, we, when we as ego dissolve back into our source, we have helped everyone. Because everyone is only a creation of this ego. So when we attain liberation, everyone attains liberation. And I, I know this is going a little bit afield from what we're talking about, but it was nonetheless interesting to me um, that even in uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, Metropolitan Callistos has talked about hidden saints who are sort of sustaining the world. And we never hear about them, but just in their silence and in their solitude and with their prayers, they're sustaining the world. Yeah. But so it's Bhagavan, similar. Yeah. Bhagavan has said the mere presence of a jnani in this world is itself a... Uh, a, a blessing for the whole world. So it's not what jnanis do or say but matters. Merely being, merely being what we actually are, that is the greatest help we can do to the world. Of course, these are the, the explanations can be given on different levels. What I said just before that, but if you wake up, that is, uh, you're you saving everyone. That is the very deepest teaching, but that's not usually how it's expressed. To say that the mere presence of a jnani in the world is, is, is coming down a, a few levels to accept that the world is there and the world exists even after the annihilation of ego, which is, of course, not the case. Yeah, so really so we, when you realize we, there are no others and there is yeah, no world. Yeah, yeah. So we need to understand the, the different teachings. In We, we need to understand... In, from which perspective or in what context each teaching is given. Sometimes there may seem to be uh, contradictions between one teaching and another, but it's just because they're different levels of explanation. That's a Bhag great point. Bhagavan is always trying to push us deeper. When we're unwilling to go deeper, he will say, he will, he will, um, he will adjust his teachings to suit our level. And really the ultimate teaching is, as we were saying, I am or just abiding as I am. And that's the real teaching. That is silence. Beautiful. I love that. Um, one other question I had was, it seems to me that um, Ramana was, was, I think it's pretty clear, was not a social reformer. Um, we talked about that briefly in email. Um, yeah. So I wonder if you'd like to talk about social, re social reform re in, in relation to Bhagavan's teachings. Bhagavan is the ultimate social reformer. Because what is the cause of all the problems of society? Ego. Ego. So Bhagavan is dealing with the root of the problem. He's not interested in treating the symptoms. That is, so long as there's a world, there will always be injustices and... Uh, and um, the world is never a perfect place. But what is the root cause of all the imperfection we see in this world? It is I. To whom does all this imperfection appear? To me. Uh, uh, get rid of this me, that is ego, 
And what remains is, is the ever perfect whole. So Bhagavan's, Bhagavan was the greatest social reformer, but he wasn't most, well, the people we generally call social reformers are superficial. They're trying to, de to, to treat the symptoms. What was Over his view the, of Gandhi? Oh, what, what was his view of Gandhi, by the way? Um, very difficult to say what Bhagavan's view is. A uh, oh. simple way of saying, uh, in Bhagavan's view, everyone is himself. <laughs> he doesn't see any others. But uh, from what has been recorded, um, uh, I think someone who had come from Gandhi and stayed, it's, Gandhi sometimes used to send people to the ashram. If people were who, who were involved in his movement in the uh, uh, fight for independence and for social justice and everything. Sometimes people would get, get a bit uh, burnt out a bit. He would say, go and spend some time in Raman Ashram and uh, recharge your batteries or something to that effect. So people used to come from Gandhi to Bhagavan. They would spend some time there and then return. One such person who had come from Gandhi once asked Bhagavan, Bhagavan, uh, it was Gandhiji who sent me here, and I'm now going back to him. Do you have any message to give him? And Bhagavan said, when heart speaks to heart, uh, uh, what need is there for spoken words? So Bhagavan, who is Bhagavan? Bhagavan is that which is shining in the heart of all jivas, as I. So Bhagavan is the I in Mahatma Gandhi. That which is the, the I, that is the ego that was aware of itself as Mahatma Gandhi. I am Mahatma Gandhi. The I am portion of that ego is Bhagavan. Just like the ego that is aware of itself as I am shown, the I am portion of that is Bhagavan. Cool. <laughs> um. There was some talk that um, I had read before that Bhagavan thought if Gandhi had actually made it to the ashram, he would have stopped doing his political activism. Is there any truth to that? I don't think Bhagavan ever said anything like that. Some devotees of Bhagavan have said like that, but perhaps that's why Gandhi was prevented because he had a certain mission. But he was, but if he had come to Bhagavan, just being merely being in Bhagavan's presence may have change his attitude and um, he may have uh, ceased all his outward going work but he that 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 person that the body of mind had a certain destiny and so that destiny was uh, was not interrupted by his coming to see Bhagavan he actually came very close he he once came to Tiruvannamalai and he would um uh, um uh, there was a, a meeting was arranged in what in those days was the cattle fair ground, um, but it later became the government arts college, the compound of the government arts college. So in that place, he, there was a meeting uh, organized and uh, Gandhi spoke at that meeting. He deliberately cut his speech short in order to have the opportunity of, of, um, of going to see Bhagavan. But that meeting was arranged by Rajaji. Rajaji means Raja Gopalachari, who later became, um, I think he was the, um, yeah, he was, he was, the, he, he succeeded Mount Batten, that after independence, for a brief time, Mount Batten remained as governor general. And then the first Indian governor general was Rajaji. And then, it, then they had their constitution and they had a president, so no longer any governor general. So I think Rajaji was the governor general later. But so he was, a, he was very, very close to Gandhiji, but he, he didn't really know Bhagavan. I don't think he had ever seen Bhagavan, but he'd heard about Bhagavan. And his, he, there were some people in those days who had the attitude, what's the use of this Ramana Maharshi just sitting alone in a cave doing nothing? When Gandhiji and others are facing prison sentences and everything and fighting for independence, why, this, why people make a fuss about this Ramana Maharshi who just sits there doing nothing? So, I mean, people had that sort of attitude. And there were various other reasons people various uh, misperceptions of Bhagavan were there. 
um, which have been spread by various malicious elements. So anyway, for some reason, uh, Rajiji was not very keen on Gandhi meeting Bhagavan. So when Gandhi cut his speech short and said, now, now we've got time, we can just go to Raman Ashram, uh, Rajiji tra started trying to dissuade him saying, oh, no, 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 it's uh, in Raman Ashram, they observe caste, caste distinctions. And, and so since you're against all caste system, it wouldn't look good if you were to go there. He started giving various arguments and he delayed the matter. And then he said, oh, but sorry, there's not time. So Gandhi's car drove past the gate of Raman Ashram and actually went past, he did Namaskaram, but he never got to meet Bhagavan. That is... Rajiji played his part, but that is all according to the destiny of Gandhiji. Now, what you say there is important. Caste system was observed in Raman Ashramam. Would you talk about that? What do you mean by caste system observed? Uh, Bhagavan's attitude towards that, as I say, Bhagavan was intent on dealing with the root problem, ego. Bhagavan himself said, the... Um, the the householder who doesn't think I am a householder is a better sannyasi than the sannyasi who feels I am a sannyasi. And he said similar about, uh, about uh, Brahmins. In, there's a verse in Guru Vachaka Kavai where Bhagavan said, only, only one whose ego is annihilated is a true Brahmin and a true sannyasi. But very hard indeed is it to eradicate the ego of those who feel I am a Brahmin or I am a sannyasi? So Bhagavan was going to the root of the problem. However, Bhagavan, um, Bhagavan didn't, because, he, because Bhagavan was focusing on the root of the problem, he didn't uh, tell people how they should behave. So that many people who came to Ramanashan, they were orthodox Brahmins. And according to their customs, they shouldn't eat with other people. So in the ashram dining hall, they had a partition. Bhagavan, there was a partition. On one side, the Brahmin sat, on the other side, the non-Brahmins. Um, that partition, Bhagavan sat opposite that partition. But actually, Bhagavan sat in such a way that he was slightly on the non-Brahmin side of the partition, but he could see all the Brahmins on on the Brahmin side. Um, so pe people interpreted this to mean Bhagavan supported the caste system. Bhagavan didn't support the caste system. Bhagavan simply allowed people to do what they wanted to do. There's a, a story told about a, a young boy, a, he, maybe a teenager, who visited the ashram, and he was a Brahmin. He... Uh, sat on the non-Brahmin side. So Bhagavan then asked him, would you do like this at home? Would you, at home, would you eat with non-Brahmins? He said, no, no, I wouldn't. Then Bhagavan said, then don't make this place an excuse. Go and sit with the uh, Brahmin. Because he knew there's an ego there. He was trying to show I'm all equal in front of Bhagavan, but outside he will do otherwise. That story has been is recorded in various places, and they say Bhagavan. They, they, it's interpreted by some people, but Bhagavan. This shows that Bhagavan approved of Brahmins eating separately. That is not the case. That boy, I knew him when he was a much older man. His name was, um, oh, um, I've forgotten his name. Was it? Raja Gopalaya, I think Raja Gopalaya was his name. I can't remember, I, I can't remember, but I knew him and he told me, but that story has been misinterpreted. He told me the story as it was. He said, why Bhagavan did that was not the, there were other non-Brahmins who sat, sorry, there were other Brahmins who sat with the non-Brahmins. Bhagavan never objected to them. The reason why he objected to him doing so is he still in his heart still had those caste feelings. That is, having been brought up in a certain society, he, in which he, he, was, he was taught that we, we shouldn't eat with non-Brahmins. He had, that was still that, um, that, that idea was still 
deeply rooted in his heart. So knowing that Bhagavan didn't want him making a show, he said, nowadays, I, of course, I've shed all these things. I don't, uh, I, I, these things don't bother me. But in those days, I, because Bhagavan knew I still had that caste feeling in my heart, he didn't want me to make an outward show of it. So how he told me was quite different to how it's recorded in some books. That is, the interpretation of it is quite different. You must have a lot of stories you could share, but you seem to really prefer to talk about the philosophy. Because the stories are useful only to the extent that they illustrate the philosophy. There are many stories, but I, I'm not generally, I mean, I, I tell stories in context, like I told this story now in the context of the question you asked. Um, but I, I'm, um, generally, I don't think much of stories, but sometimes in particular context, when it illustrates a particular point or answers a particular question, then, then it comes to mind and I tell it. Do you want to go on record as being against any gurus that are out there today? Or you, you said to me, you just like to talk about ideas, not about persons. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Because there's one person I'd really I, like to I have mention. only I have only one enemy. There's only <laughs> one who is causing me so much trouble. I, <laughs> I would like to criticize only him. That's very wise. Okay. You well, know who that we, is? Ego or Michael? Ego, ego. <laughs> Not Michael. Michael is innocent. Poor Michael. Don't blame <laughs> Michael. It is the okay. I that says I am Michael. He's the mischief monger. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, we've, we've already talked about Neo Advaita. You don't really feel the need to talk about that anymore, or would you like to, how it well, differs nothing, from Unless you've speaking. got anything particular to ask, it's, uh, it, it doesn't particularly interest me or concern me. No, that's oh, but fine. There, I, there is one thing, there is one thing I can put, because I, I heard it, the subject being discussed. Apparently, um, Neo Advaitins talk about the direct path and the progressive path. Uh, they, they, these were not terms I had heard before, but apparently a lot of them do. And what they, their idea is that the direct path means you just see, you, you, you're just told you are that. And then you just recognize that you are that, and then there's nothing more to be done. And they think the traditional, uh, the, the approach of traditional Advaita, studying all the Upanishads and everything, that is a very, what they, they describe that as the progressive path. They, they think that they're, they're trying to slowly purify the mind and everything. And they, they, they somehow think that's a, an inferior path to their idea of whatever they mean by direct path. So I just wanted to say in that context, that is the term direct path. Um, it was a term as far, it may have been used before, but it, it's, uh, it was, uh, it may either it was coined by Bhagavan or it became, it is, it is from Bhagavan that they picked up this term direct path. The context in which Bhagavan used the term direct path is in verse 17 of Upadesha India. He said, um, uh, when the mind without negligence or without forgetfulness, when, when one investigates the form of the mind without forgetfulness or without negligence, um, uh, there's no such thing as mind at all. This is the direct path for all. What he means by that is, but investigating the form of mind means investigating this ego. When we turn our attention within to investigate ourselves, if we investigate ourselves keenly enough, we'll find there's no such thing as mind or ego at all. This is the direct path. Why does he say it's the direct path? Because what we are seeking to know is only ourself. What we are seeking to get rid of, what prevents us knowing ourselves is ego. So what is the direct means of knowing what we actually are and thereby getting rid of ego? It's only attending to ourselves. So it's logical. This is the direct path. He doesn't say this path is not progressive. This direct path is not any, as soon as you've got the word path, you've got the idea of progress. There's no point in having a path if you just sit on the, in the middle of a road without progressing. If you've got, a, you've got a road, you need to progress along it. So we need to progress back within. So why is it a progressive path? Because as Bhagavan pointed out, the all we need to do is to surrender ourselves, And we can surrender ourselves only by turning our attention back 
the full 180 degrees. But at present, we're not willing to surrender ourselves. We're not willing to let go of everything else. So why are we not willing? Because we still have our vishaya of asanas is still relatively strong. So, but, but, but practice is necessary in order to weaken the vishaya of asanas. Every time our attention is drawn outwards by vishaya of asana, we need to turn it back within. So this, is a, this direct path is a progressive path. So all these neo advaitins who talk, who who think that they whatever they, they they think they have some sort of a shortcut. It is a shortcut in the sense that the direct path is obviously the shortest path, but it, it doesn't mean you don't have to work at it. it. Practice is required, patient, persistent practice, until we give up all inclination to attend to anything other than ourselves, and thereby are willing to turn within and surrender ourselves completely. So I've that's, heard you. Yeah, in the context, since you asked, in the context that you, you asked about Neo-Advaita, I, I, I heard um, that this, this, these terms are used. And I thought these are, this is a meaningless distinction. Those who, who make a distinction between a progressive path and a, and, and a direct path haven't understood the we have to progress along the direct path. I think the consensus is kind of like you, you progress, you progress, you progress, and then all of a sudden it's sudden. Is that? Yes, that is the case, but you have to progress to get there, to get to yeah. that point. It's sudden because, as I said, you, you cannot, either you're aware of yourself as pure awareness, or you're aware of yourself as something other than pure awareness. So long as you're aware of yourself as something other than pure awareness, if you are ego. So ego needs to progress in the sense that it needs to slowly, slowly shed its vishaya of asanas. That is, it needs to, its vishaya of asanas need to reduce in strength in order to, for ego to turn the full 180 degrees within to eradicate itself. So the direct path is a progressive path in the sense that we have to progress along it. Yeah, there's a similar thing in Zen. They, they call it gradual and sudden enlightenment. But it's not two different things. It's, the, the, the path is gradual. The goal is instantaneous. I agree. That makes sense. I think that is kind of the consensus view with people who think about it more. And I, and I think uh, you've, you've mentioned Sadhu Om said something about um, loading up a cannon with yeah, powder yeah. and then you yeah. and then it booms yeah 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 you've got all the preparation takes time but the actual lighting of i mean it, lighting of the cannon is it happens in an instant and it's very rare that someone like ramana actually gets it because the idea is he was working on it in previous incarnations yeah, but, but himself indicated that cool. something but with a do vitukurai totukurai he said something that was left incomplete it resumed. Cool. So related to thought, there's two things I wanted to say on thought. One is you said Bhagavan will even think for you. And then another place you said Bhagavan never said to stop thinking. Yeah. Can that you is, explain that? Yes. That is, if you try to stop thinking, you're thinking about thinking. It's counterproductive. Bhagavan once it recorded, I think, uh, um, I think uh, Lakshman Sharma has recorded in uh, Mahayoga or somewhere, but uh, Bhagavan uh, once remarked, or it may have been in some context, I don't know exactly what the context was. In yoga, they say yoga's chitta vritti nirodaha. That is the very first yoga sutra is uh, yoga is the restraint is is to restrain the the chitta vrittis the, the 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 movements of the mind or the the, the modifications of the mind. Bhagavan said that is not practical. Uh, here we say atman vaishana. Atman vaishana means in self investigation. Why did Bhagavan say that? Because so long as you're trying to give up thoughts. Your attention is going away from yourself towards thoughts are a problem. How do I give them up? You're attending to something other. Forget about thoughts. 
Let thoughts continue or let them not continue. They're no concern of yours. Your only concern should be to attend to yourself. If you do attend to yourself, then thoughts will automatically stop because how can there be any thoughts if you're, unless you attend to them? There's a, lot out, there's a lot out there that is very wrong-headed on this subject. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's, it, people, when people first start to learn meditation, the, the first idea is first you need to give up thoughts. According to Bhagavan, the meditator is in himself a thought, himself or herself. That is, the eye that is meditating is ego, which is itself a thought. So long as that first thought is there, there will be other thoughts also. Because that first thought cannot um, stand without, uh, without holding on to other thoughts. Um, that's one thing. Another way of explaining it, in yoga, in order to bring about this chitta vritti, naroda, in order to bring about the cessation of uh, mental activity, we can say, they have all sorts of techniques, pranayama and various forms of concentration, meditation, and so on. And by following yoga techniques, if you do it properly with proper guidance, you can bring about the cessation of thoughts. But Bowman says, you, you don't have to do yoga to bring about the cessation of thoughts. Just spend a day of act, a normal day of activity. When it comes to nighttime, you're so tired, you just go to bed and you see, you, you bring your all mental activity to a cessation because you're too tired to continue thinking. Bringing about the cessation of thoughts is what is called manolaya. It is of no, it, if you, if you bring about uh, um, manolaya by means of yoga techniques, you can call the state you bring about nivikalpa samadhi, but it's actually no different to sleep. Right? Any state, when, when the mind has ceased to exist, there are no differences. So how can there be a difference between sleep and nivikalpa samadhi? Right. The yogis may think that there's a, it's a different state. They can say, oh, I, I, I retained awareness throughout that state. But the same awareness is there even in sleep. They just overlook the fact. So if we recognize that sleep is a state of awareness, there's no difference between sleep and nivikalpa samadhi. It's just a, the difference is only in the view of the mind in waking state, there seems to be a difference. May there's another, mis there's another yeah. misunderstanding. I'm sorry. They, so that difference is only from the perspective of the mind. So Nivikalpa Samadhi, like the one brought about by yoga, is just a state of Manolaya. Bhagavan said Manolaya is useless because the mind will rise again and none of the Vishaya Vasanas are destroyed. And he, to illustrate this, he often used to tell the story of the, the yogi on the banks of the Ganga who went into Nivikalpa Samadhi for 300 years. And when he woke up, the first thing he asked was, where's my water? because he had been asking for a, a cup of water before um, he went into Nivikalpa Samadhi. Bhagavan said, even the, 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 the last thought he had when he went in was the first thought he had when he came out. That means none of the Vishaya Vasanas have been eradicated. So that illustrates, Bhagavan told that story to illustrate, but attaining, seeking, Nivika, seeking Nivikalpa Samadhi or any form of Manolaya is futile. Do you know who we, we need to bring about the eradication of ego? That is the root problem. How to bring about the eradication of ego in the waking or dream state? While ego is active, it needs to turn within to see itself as pure awareness. As soon as ego sees itself as pure awareness, it ceases to be ego and pure awareness alone remains. Because what sees pure awareness is only pure awareness. Well, you've just brought up another point that I've heard someone misunderstand before, which is when Bhagavan was talking about always being aware, always being what he is, that which he is, um, even during sleep, some people, one person in particular, took that to mean kind of like they're still conscious as ego, it seems to me, when they're sleeping rather than... Yeah, people miss the point. And some people think, I mean, I've seen people saying that um, according to Bhagavan, Minyani is conscious during sleep. Bhagavan doesn't say, where's the difference between Jnani and Agnani in sleep? There's no difference. All differences appear only in waking a dream. We, 
that is, it is a, this is a fundamental problem, uh, uh, principle of Bhagavan's teachings. What are we actually? We have a fundamental awareness, I am. That is, what is I am? That is our fundamental awareness of our own existence. That is always shining, whether in waking or in dream or in sleep. The reason why sleep seems to be a state of non-awareness, because we are constantly looking outwards, we take the awareness of phenomena to be awareness. In sleep, there is no awareness of phenomena. But because only if we practice during the waking state, trying to turn our attention back to be aware of that which is aware, will we recognize that sleep is clearly a state of awareness. It's always a Sounds state of awareness. We just fail to recognize it until we, I mean, Bowen gives logical argument to, to convince us that sleep is a state of awareness. But for us to really recognize it, we need to put his teachings into practice. The, more, the deeper we go in the practice of self-investigation, the more blindingly obvious it is that sleep is a state of awareness. We don't need any arguments uh, for that. We are always... What appears and disappears is ego and its awareness of phenomena. When, but whether ego appears and um, ego and phenomena appear or they don't appear, what we are always aware of is I am. And that exists whether there's a body or not. Yeah. Whether there's an ego or not. If there's the an ego, ego, then there's a body and world. 